Hello and welcome to the Clean Bill of Wealth podcast for Canadian doctors. I am your host, Galen Nuttall. Join me as I interview doctors and related professionals and talk about what it takes to achieve wealth in this, the Great White North. Not just wealth is measured by a bank account, but also family, faith, and health. Be sure to go to galenhelpsdocs.com. That is G-A-L-E-N. That is how my name is spelled. Helpsdocs.com to get access to my free video series where I uncover the top myths about growing your wealth as a doctor north of the wall. Now, please enjoy the show. We're, we're Liberty Lab. So I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but the Global Mail reporter is doing this uh, and having it ready in time for Valentine's Day. And talking about couples and money and Valentine's Day and all that. So I thought I should kick it off with a joke about love. Did you hear about the bed bugs who fell in love? No. <laughs> They're getting married in the spring. <laughs> All right. There you go. Uh, getting married in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> Bed bugs, uh, spring. Woo! All right. So, cool. All right. So, man, so <laughs> we're going to talk about money and couples and finances and the biggest mistakes people make as couples and uh, what to do about it. Okay. So, tell me, what are some of the mistakes that couples make when uh, planning out their financial future? That's a good question, Dave. Um, and actually I should let people know it's very apropos Priet, that you and I should be talking about this because we're, we're a technically family. We're, we're brother-in-laws twice, once removed. <laughs> yeah. Is that in, what case, in case people don't, in case people don't, in case people don't know that. I, I find it, uh, I mean, yeah, it is a little hard to calculate. What is it? Uh, what is the term for? I'm not sure what it is in English. In Spanish, it's cocuñado. And I don't know how to say it without making it sound like we're doing some deliverance thing. Because I'm like, we're married to sisters. And that just sounds wrong. <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> like yeah. I feel like drawing it. Like, here's, 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 here, where am I? Like, here's me, here's Dave. And our wives are related. Our wives are sisters. But not sister wives. That's a different show. <laughs> it's a diff that's a different thing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different Ball of wax. We're not talking about that tonight. Whew. That, All that right. would certainly cool. complicate the and financial you're in California, picture. And I'm in Ontario. That's right. That's true. Yeah, the biggest mistake. <laughs> no, it's it's a big mistake, but it's a very rare one. <laughs> don't don't marry sister wives. And it's illegal in probably a lot of places. <laughs> Don't do it. See, it's, you get all these bank that. accounts and joint accounts, and I mean, banks just have a big problem. So, that's gonna that's gonna mess right, things cool. up. So, when it comes to um, that's gonna mess things up. Um, yeah, that that's a money 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 problem, big time. All right. So, uh, mistakes people make about money. All right. So the biggest thing. Okay. So I was talking to a relationship coach recently. And this relationship coach was like, Galen, you know the biggest two things I help couples with. Like the two things that are consistently the top of the list that couples are having issues with around like, you know, just a mismatch. And it was sex and money. And I was like, wow, the job that I do is like in the top two around helping people with stuff. So big mistakes people make. One is, I'm not gonna talk about the other one. One is um, that bed bugs. I think it's, it's, it's bed bugs. Yeah. <laughs> Get married in the spring. Um, <laughs> so the um, big, big mistake people make is like not communicating, not communicating expectations, I would say. So by that, I mean, everyone has a relationship with money and people will oftentimes assume that the other person or the other people in their lives have a very similar relationship that, oh, it makes sense that I think this way about money. So everyone else does too. And couples, what I find is they'll get into a relationship assuming the other person is on board with their view of money. And so like an example, like, uh, you know, someone who's really great at budgeting and is like really cautious every month and like wants to know where the money's going might end up with someone who doesn't give a flying, you know what about that. And then it's going to cause some tension because it's like, holy cow, I'm the responsible one. This person doesn't care. 
And um, if they're not communicating, if the one person isn't communicating to the other one, like, uh, this isn't how I roll, we got to do something about this. It's going to cause problems eventually. And the other thing, aspect of that is, it's not like anyone's, it's not like the person who budgets is right and the person who doesn't is wrong. It's just two different approaches. And the world needs like both. And what I find a lot when I sit with couples is typically one of them is like the budgeter, like the one like on top of things and they got like the app going and they got the budget going and they're like, we're over on this. We're, you know, we're doing good with this. And the other one is usually like an optimistic kind of like, it'll all work out. We'll figure it out. Like, don't worry about the day to day. Not always, but I see that a lot. And um, if they're not communicating about if one of them is stressed because they're over budget or spending money on things they weren't expecting, it's going to be hard to uh, for them to be at peace around the money. And the last thing I'll say about that is when people do communicate, I'd say the worst, it's like a big issue. Like something has just happened, like a bill has been overdue or an unexpected payment or like a car thing has popped up. To talk about money in that moment when everyone's like worked up over this unexpected thing is the not a good time. It's like got to wait until things have like calmed down. Got to wait, like schedule that time to get together and consult about that rather than when things are like running high emotionally because the conversation just isn't going to be a good one. Got it. So the mistake is either uh, either you say the mistake is talking about money when tensions are high or the mistake is missing the opportunity to talk about money when things are just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, or hey, like, by the I, by the way, I'm not stressed about money today. Maybe it's a good time to talk to you about <laughs> perspective. Yeah. And like make it fun. Like, you know, if you're gonna do some budgeting, because like first off, budgeting is a terrible word. I hate the word budgeting. I prefer uh spending plan. Hmm. Because it's like I get to plan how I get to spend my money. Budgeting sounds very like scarcity and like I'm going to run out of it. So I don't like I don't like the word budgeting at all. That's interesting. Um, I think of it kind of the opposite, like that a plan is something specific that's going to happen. But a budget is uh, a rough. It's a forecast given, hmm. you know, past history and data. And then uh, whether you go over budget or you're under budget, like going over budget. Well, you um, you learn something under budget you also learn something either way you know you have to take some action as a result yeah yeah, yeah for sure. but then again and i also work with a bunch of like like project yeah, uh, like project managers and and people who are really really precise about plans and mm. uh you know the connotation there maybe maybe just different yeah, so yeah. okay so let me ask you about uh, what's a good strategy for, uh, for making talking about money fun? Yeah. So what I'd say is I, I got this from a colleague of mine who said her and her husband every year, they do a, um, like a household, like money planning session, like at the, at the beginning of the year to kind of plan what it's going to look like that year. And they called it, um, what do they call it? Like their year in review or like their, their, uh, strategic session or something like that. And so they set aside the time when that's exactly what they were going to talk about, cleaned up the distractions around it. Um, so that's one big thing is like, so, so it doesn't have to be like a yearly thing. It can be a monthly thing, but I'd say like setting aside the time and saying, this is the time we're going to do it in our calendar. And I mean, to make it fun, go blow a lot of money on an expense. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, to make it fun, uh, you know, do something fun around it that you enjoy, like, you know, reward yourself. If some, if the person, if there's a person in the relationship that doesn't want to have this conversation, it's like, think of a way to get rewarded afterwards. And like, oh, I'm going to binge watch uh, the office on Netflix for a couple hours after this. Um, Cause what I see when I meet with couples, and I mean, the other thing I'll say is sometimes like when I meet with couples, I, I'm insist that both couples are at the meetings because what invariably happens is when I'm going to meet with a couple, one of them mm -hmm. usually has either, I mean, both of them might have this, but one of them is willing to express it or it's enough for them to actually not show up is that they've got shame around what they're doing with money. They feel like they should have done things differently or they're, they're, they don't like math. They're worried about, you know, having to look at a lot of numbers and a lot of graphs and things like that. Um, but really the conversation I have with people is not just it's like, especially the first meeting is not, it's not usually like a numbers and graphs kind of a meeting. It's more of a goal setting meeting. It's more of a, you know, 
future let's look at the future where do we want to be and then later it's a bit more and when i even when i do use numbers it's more of visuals and i don't like to bore people with like extended like digits of numbers so but then one what i find is like one spouse will usually say i just don't even want to be at these meetings like i'm just worried we're going to talk too much numbers i'm not going to like it um you know i've had clients say to me like i grew up where my parents fought about money a lot so it seems to me like it's always something that leads to arguments but what I find is that when both people are at the table, the conversation just goes a lot faster because sometimes I'll say something to, it, before I insisted on this or like I said, uh, it, you know, I'd talk to one spouse and they'd go back to the other spouse and say, oh, today we decided we should do this. And the spouse would say, oh, well, we can't do that because of this information that you either didn't have or didn't think of at the time. You got to go back and change that. And I did that with a couple once like years ago. This isn't working. Like unless a couple manages their money separately or they have like a really strong feeling about going to these meetings separately, then I haven't come to the table together. And for a lot of couples, it's sometimes it's the first time anyone's ever first time they've had these conversations about any of this. Like, what do you want retirement to look like? Uh, you know, how much money do you feel like you should have set aside for an emergency on any of those things? A lot. Not a lot of couples sit around and talk about that sort of a thing. Mm. So sometimes it's helpful to have that third person in the room asking the questions because then it's kind of like, oh, it's not me forcing you to have this conversation. Like we're both here and there's this third party that's just collecting data and information and like taking us through a guided process. Mm, interesting. So is another uh, mistake that couples make perhaps uh, being uh, being too tight with money? Uh, good question. Being too tight with money. Um, I mean, I'd look at if someone, I mean, you think like one of the people, one of the, one of the, one of the people in the relationship, the other one's being too tight or like both of them are too tight. Like, what do you mean? Well, I'm thinking about like one of the, uh, a, a nice thing to do when, uh, you know, a, a nice thing to do as a couple is to like spend money together to have fun. Right. But to, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like to never, never ha have any fun, worry too much about, um, you, you know, not spending money uh, so that you miss out on, you know, enjoying life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely what I've seen is, and I mean, this is personal too. Like I have trouble spending money on non-essentials for myself. Like, um, I'll give an example, like going skiing or something like that. Like going skiing is pretty expensive. I love it. And, but it's hard for me to be like, oh yeah, I should fork over all this money to go skiing. Like it's hard for me to do that. I can do it for someone else, maybe like spend it on someone else. So, but like I said, like you were saying, like a, a family can really have a lot of fun doing things that do require money. And I think that it can be part of the planning is, you know, how much can we spend? Or if we feel like this is too much, is there another way we could also have fun as a family where we're not spending as much and when it comes to that like when i see people typically spend their time and their money on the things that are most important to them and even if they don't say it out loud it's where we gravitate towards um so i say to people like sometimes people will look at what how they've spent their money over the last month and sometimes they'll be surprised at the things they spent money on that they didn't realize and it's usually things that were important to them but they just, it was almost like a unconscious spending of this is important to me. I want it now. I'm going to spend it. And so if someone is, is like, if people are being like too tight about it, but it's restricting, like, let's say someone's, someone loves spending time with their family and they really want to go do something with their family that's going to cost some money. And if they don't do it because they're being too tight or too careful, then they really have to look at, is this aligned with their values or not? Like, the, or is there a way to, to get what they want values wise by spending time with the family without spending the money? Or does it just make sense to go ahead and spend it and just like find a way to make that guilt free? Like mm. just say, you know what, this is the money I'm spending. This is what we're doing. Let's do it guilt free. Let's just have a bunch of fun with it. Interesting. We're talking a lot about spending money and how couples uh, think about spending. Um, I guess another aspect of that is how a couple thinks about saving. So we're talking, you know, mistakes around uh, financial planning. So what's a mistake that couples make related to saving money? 
Yeah. So a mistake that couples make regarding saving money. I mean, from a technical standpoint, I see that a lot of couples, um, they just kind of do default things that like if one, if one person in the relationship works for a company and the other one doesn't, it's kind of automatically contribute to like a company plan or things like that without actually figuring out whether it makes more sense for the other spouse to do it. Um, so I'd say that's one of the problems is, you know, they've read a lot of people I meet, they read an article, they read a book, and they're doing everything based on this one piece of information or this one snapshot in time. When in fact, if they had someone with them looking at the big picture, they might do things differently. So that's a bit from like a tactical standpoint that a lot of couples just, they do just sort of like this double double advice hitting from you know, TV or a newspaper, or like a magazine or a book, which doesn't actually work with their situation. Uh, then from a standpoint of, more of like a relationship status is inherently it's hard for humans to do things to for pleasure for a future possibility. So like inherently humans are not hardwired and there's a lot of research about this. And in a couple of weeks, I'm interviewing two um, behavioral economists that I met about a lot of the stuff that's coming out around why it's so hard for people to save for the future. And so people typically aren't hardwired to do that. But may, if one person in the relationship had parents who taught them to put away 10, 20% every month or 10, you know, like they had one of those rules of thumb that they've followed that's actually serving them really well. If the other uh, person in the relationship doesn't get why they're doing that or doesn't see the future benefits strongly enough, it could be where they resent, like they resent this. Like, why are we saving this way? Like, why are we saving so much money? And a lot of that will have to do with their background what their parents taught them about money, you know, the, the own, their own situation of how they've managed money on their own before they became a couple. Uh, and again, you know, a lot of that will be solved through communication about why we're doing something the way we're doing. And like I said, sometimes the, if there is one spouse who's like investing and saving and doing all that stuff, the other one might feel like they need to be very hands off about that. Like a lot of times there is that you know, like I used to be a teacher, so I had students that were what I would call like math phobic, you know, like they just, they were told themselves that they weren't good at math and math was scary. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be like they can, they can still make sense of what they're doing and why without getting bogged down in lots of crazy numbers. Got it. So uh, to, so you mentioned this principle about like, uh, if one person is familiar with the idea of like paying yourself first, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you, you put it, you, you, uh, before you allocate your money to anything uh, like your, ex your expenses or, or your, your, your plan, you first, you, you pay yourself 10% or whatever you set aside a, a certain amount. So then the other member of the, of the family, the other cup, uh, the other, the partner would say, um, you know, we're stockpiling all of this money, you know, for a rainy day, but you know, I don't have a number of things that I want. So why can't I have those things or, or whatever? So that's, so I guess having a conversation early about the principles around how much to, uh, to save for a rainy day and what the projection, I guess, um, well, I guess, okay. So is another question about, uh, a mistake that couples make, about not understanding the time horizon, you know, how the length of time in which you're going to to save in order to achieve a certain goal, or or, or understanding when you might want to retire. Like, is that even something that, uh, let's say, young couples understand what thirty years of saving would actually look like? Yeah, for sure. And it's really hard. I mean, you know, I meet a lot of young couples who are you know, uh, they're, they've got kids, they've got a house, they got mortgage, they got all these expenses. And I meet people who someone might say, oh, they make a lot of money. But if they've got all these expenses as well, it's really hard for people to uh, inherently, you know, put money aside for the future. Because it's like, well, I've still my kids are young, I got to worry about their education, you know, I got to worry about their education. Um, you know, oh, we're, we're young, we got all this mortgage, we got to worry about that. So it's hard for people to do that. And I mean, one of the big things that can help you know, and I mean, this is broad advice for couples, depending on what stage of life they're in. But like, I always talk about like the Timmy's Starbucks conundrum where, you know, like, and I'll use myself as an example. When Em and I moved to Canada, she was working. I wasn't. When I would get coffee, I would make it at home. And every once in a while, I'd splurge on a Timmy's. 
on a on a beautiful double double and it was rare because i'm like yeah she's working i'm not then when i started working it was like boom starbucks three times a week like we're rolling in it and then like when she quit her job it's like oh i got used to starbucks three times a week it's really hard for me to go back to timmy's um this feels like pain because i'm not getting this thing i used to get so what i say to people is like when you go from this to this like pretend so if you go from here to here pretend you only went to here this is all for future you like future you gets this present you gets this because it's much harder it's much easier rather to go from here to here than up and then like back down again like when i meet people who aren't saving and they're spending you know they're, they're spending everything they make to try to get them to cut back is much harder than they had just in the first place not gotten used to that expansion of income and uh, that applies for couples too and it's easy to happen like i did an article i was interviewed about this you know the technical term is is lifestyle creep where your lifestyle creeps up to match your paycheck if you're not careful and um like you're saying like one person in the relationship might understand pay yourself first the other person might not and it would be another i mean a big thing i recommend is if you've read a book on money that helps shape you the way that you look at money get your partner to read that book too like be like read the same books like read the same things about this topic it'll help get you on the same page mm -hmm. yeah so that also goes back to this theme of uh of getting on the same page or getting com you know communicating clearly about uh, priorities yes yeah getting on the same page literally what is reading you, the same books what is your uh, what is your thought about uh, calibrating a couple's understanding of risk. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so like to quickly define risk as I see it. Well, okay. So, you know, risk, you know, volatility, I guess, like you're putting money away and if you're investing it, there's a, there's a chance it'll go up. There's a chance it'll go down. Um, one of the biggest things I find is that when people have, especially like, I'll get in front of young people and a lot of times they will have an illogical aversion to volatility in the sense that I don't want to invest money. I think it's the same as gambling. Um, I, 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 I don't think it's going to work. I'm going to play it super safe. And usually when I dive deeper in those conversations, they usually they have some story or some, some background around a parent who lost a whole bunch of money in the market at some point like they they went in all they went all in on aol in 1999 or whatever 1998 and lost it all you know and uh they think that that's what it had and with a little bit of education i can show them like well it doesn't have to be that way like that's not the only way to to, to do this to have you know to have a consistent approach to managing investments that historically will get you ahead of the game and a lot of times there is you know, I, I certainly see some disparity in couples where, where one, it has more of a, um, what is it like more of like the, the, the conservative approach to, well, I've seen my, I saw people lose money. I don't want to lose money. So let's just play it super safe. And at the end of the day, historically speaking, the people who play it super safe just end up with way less than the people who are willing to take on some more volatility. So it's usually a conversation to see why people feel the way they do. And then just a history lesson on the way the world has worked for the last hundreds of years and how I believe it's going to work for the next hundreds of years. And then people can get to a point where they're still happy with what they're doing. Like they're, they're, they're on board with it, uh, but they understand why they're doing it. And it's usually just a lack of understanding of the way things work when mm. people are illogically uh, conservative, which is what I find. Um, on the other hand, you got people who like throw money at all sorts of things without even investigating whether it's a legit opportunity or not. <laughs> That's right. a whole different uh, ball of wax. Like that is true though. I mean, like I do see that, like, you know, one, one per one person in the couple, not to be sexist, but it's usually the guy who's just like, no, nah, no, nah, like this thing's going to work. Like this thing's going to take off. Let's chuck all our money at it. It's a sure and thing. Whatever. It's a sure thing. It's going to work. Oh man, there was one. And I don't want to talk about oh, there's, there was one in this area a couple of years ago where people were making these crazy promises completely unregulated completely unregulated investment schemes where this guy was promising all sorts of crazy returns and i knew people who were like yeah this look this guy checked 
checks out. He looks legit. We should do this. And actually, I'll use myself as an example in a minute. And luckily, and people are like, Alan, like, what are, like, who, let's just, like, not my, not, not Emma. Emma wasn't telling me to do this. Like, other people I knew were saying, Galen, you know, you, you need to know about this. And I was like, there's no way this is true. Like, he was talking about like 500% rate of return every two months or something, or not 500%, like, yeah, if I, something like that, like, like quadrupling your money every couple months. And I was like, this just doesn't happen. And apparently, he ended up with like millions of dollars from people. And uh, it was all, it was all a Ponzi scheme. And uh, what I will say, though, is my right. own personal experience that's not quite as crazy is a couple years ago, before I became an advisor, and I was very much blown around by the breezes of the covers of Michael All About. It was a cover of a magazine. I remember it very distinctly. It would have been like 2012 or 2011. And it was all about the real estate crash is about to happen, <clears throat> like any day now. Canadian real estate is going to go the way of the United States circa 2008, 2009. It's all going to tank. All the signs look the same. And the cover of the magazine had a picture of a house with like that red stock, like, like arrow thing. And it was like up, down, up, down. And then the thing was crashing through the roof of the house and like blowing the house up. And there was like a family standing on the yard watching their house get blown up by this red arrow. And I was at my dentist's office or whatever. And I read, I read that article and I was like, oh my God. I was like, Emma, we have to sell our house. We have to rent for a year like sell our house for whatever it was back then, let's say $350,000. We got sell our house for 350, rent for a year, and then we're going to be able to buy back our old house for like $100,000 because the markets are going to like explode and the housing market is going to tank. Like this article has shown me the way. Luckily, we didn't do that because <laughs> not only did it not happen in 2011, it didn't happen two years later when the same magazine published basically the same article saying, no, no, this time it's really about to happen. Nor did it happen two years later when they published another article saying, no, no, this time it's really going to happen. <laughs> We're really, really so, sure. I was not going to follow through with it. Yeah, yeah this time it's really going to happen. Um, I wasn't, I luckily, like, you know, Emma is much more level headed than me. And at the time I didn't, like, at the time I was prone to get excited about these, like, you know, sort of quick things that I thought were going to work. Um, but having, you know, I, it's not like I was going to follow through with it, but uh, either way, Emma would have like helped of this is far too risky. <laughs> like we can't do this. <laughs> right. To kibosh that. I mean, it's uh, something else came, came to me while you were uh, describing that uh, a mistake that couples might make around financial planning is becoming a couple before they've had a conversation about finances. <laughs> Right. Deciding to get married and, and to join, you know, join the pools of income and, you know, and, and committing to spend together and to, you know, and, and to, to plan and all that stuff, like getting married before you have that conversation and suddenly finding that, oh, we're actually completely on different planets with these things. Absolutely. And I mean, I like I remember when Em and I were going to get married and I remember um I was at a bookstore and there was like this book, it was like this thick and it was like a workbook to get yourself ready for marriage. And I was like in love, you know, I was like, I don't want to think about all this. I was like, I just want to get married. <laughs> like, I don't want to go through all this. You know, obviously we'd had lots of conversations. We'd never had as far as I can remember a money conversation, but like, I didn't want to think about any of this stuff. I'm like, I don't want to talk about this right now. I just want everything to be good. And I just want to get married. So I think most couples don't talk. And I had a client recently that was really funny. They said, um, my husband, as we were getting married, said, I spend money like a poor person. And she's like, oh, okay. To her, that meant that he was really careful with his money because he didn't know when he would have more. Then they got married and they got moving along and he and she noticed that he just spent everything he made. And she's like, I thought you said you spent money like a poor person. He's like, well, I do. I just spend it all. Like, that's what poor people do. Like, I'm poor, I've been poor. Like, my family's been poor. Like, that's what we do. And she's like, oh. I misunderstood what that meant. <laughs> uh -huh. I thought, <laughs> and you, I thought you were I mean, saying like, I think it's one of those frugal. things. Where couples... I thought you were saying you were frugal, and you're saying I'm yeah. like hand to mouth. And um, yeah, for sure, that's what they thought. So there was obviously a miscommunication there. Um, yeah, for sure. Like, and I think that, like you're saying, if a couple has that conversation before they get married, then it's easier for them to hit the ground running making decisions around, you know, what, and I think a big part of it, just to reiterate that values conversation is for one person, something might make sense. And for the other person, it doesn't. So I'll give an example. Um, let's just say 
like if I'm married, you know, if someone's someone who really loves going to concerts is married to someone who could care less about concerts, it might be a tough go for this person to be like, I am going to plunk down all this money. I'm not picking on you because I know you guys like concerts, but uh, <laughs> like I've been. <laughs> But somebody um, in our in our uh, partnership likes them more than uh, <laughs> All right, I guess that's a conversation. No, um, and still we, prior I mean, like, we prioritize, right? In order to yeah, so you, order you, to, you, uh, yeah, so you prioritize, right? Because it is important, and you like see, okay, it's important, even if it's more important to them than to me. We figure it out. Um, but if like some, if one person is doing it you know, willy nilly and the other person's completely not on board and being like, I don't get why we're spending all this money on this thing. Uh, it's, I don't like it. You know, if they're not talking about it, there's going to be stewing. And like the other person might like travel way more. Like I like traveling, but Emma likes it way more than I do. Like she's that, that's her thing. She's like, you win the lottery, you travel a ton. And I like travel. Like I like seeing new places, but I don't find it as exciting as other things. Um, I like, you know, doing sports more or something. Um, but you know, you know, we've come, we know, we understand like, this is how much we're going to travel this year, you know? And if, if this happens, then we can travel a bit more, or, you know, that sort of a thing. And, but we're on board with it for each other. So, um, that would be the conversation of like, if people's values aren't in line, like, and they don't see why that other person, and, and then and the easiest thing to jump to is like, this person should not care about this as much as they do which is like not a good conversation to come from. Like if I said you shouldn't like travel as much as you do, like, cause I don't like it or I don't want to spend money on it. That would not work. Right. <laughs> so that, so we, figure, that we should have the same values. point of view, right? Yeah, it's not, exactly. it's not just about having, you don't have to have the same point of view. You have to respect each other's point of view and come to some kind of harmonious, you know, point uh, that's, that, that suits you both. Yeah, absolutely. Another another question about financial planning mistakes. You know, it's interesting that we're talking as family members. I would imagine that couples don't often talk about what what obligations or responsibilities might they have in relation to family members, right? Like in, like in relation to what, sorry? In, in relation to family members, like you and you Got and it. Layla, you and Emma Layla and I, we all talked, uh, also with Bobak and Karen, we all talked among the siblings about our responsibilities towards aging parents and grandparents, right? And of course, that's going to be a conversation that we have, you know, for, you know, for throughout our lives. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like when we were first a couple, I don't know that that's something that we talked about. Like, we never talked about like, hey, you know, how might we plan for what might happen with our, you know, I don't know if that's, does that make sense? What, what would you say oh, is, is other um, advice as far as financial planning for, um, you know, for, for extended family? Yeah, like for sure. Your responsibility towards extended family. Yeah, that's definitely a big one. Um, and I mean, it's going to be more and more common. You mentioned the aging parents. It's, I see it more and more when I ask, even people in their thirties, uh, you know, what's one of your goals. And it is, I know that I'm gonna have to support my parents at some point in time. And it's going to get more and more common as time goes on that specific thing. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, the other thing that I've seen, obviously, you know, certainly pops up is, you know, a family member that maybe needs financial support at some point and the couple has to figure that out too. Like, well, you know, should we give them money? Should we not give them money? Should we support them? Should we not support them? And, it's a tough thing to look at. And the thing about parents is just, like I said, it's going to be as this boomer generation gets older, you know, I mean the, 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 the percent or the, the rate at which people are getting turning 65 and turning 70 and so on is just going to keep going up while this big group of people moves through. And the, the kids in their thirties and forties are getting more and more sandwiched around this topic of having parents that um, didn't have pensions or, you know, didn't save enough. And it's definitely a big conversation to have. And I mean, one of the big ones is to come to terms with what does that, what does that number even look like? Because care for an aging parent can be really expensive. And 
it's I think that's one of the big ones is like what are what numbers are we even looking at? Like, do we need to call a home and find out what those things cost right now? Um, because I'd say the biggest issue is when people don't talk about it and it happens. It's it's really difficult to figure it out. It's like you know the stress level is really high. The parent needs help now, and no one has even talked about who's going to be able to pull this off. Um, so it's not fun to think about. It's not fun to talk about, but it is a reality for a lot of uh, a lot of people in their 30s, 40s, 50s for my parents. And obviously, right. the couple has to be on board with that. You know, as that uh, as they make that decision. Yeah, and not every not every couple like in our. In our family, we have couples of different means and different circumstances, right? We live in very different areas, right? Uh, Ontario and California are very different expense wise. Yeah. You know, so we have, uh, so that's another thing is that, you know, family members all have to be able to come together. It's not just about financial planning as a, as, as a couple, you have to be open and willing to have relationships with, with your family members. You probably have to have, a more, more harmonious relationship than a lot of fam, you know families do, right? It's th there is this tendency to be like, okay, well that's your that's that's your brother's problem, that's my sister's problem, that's these right. you know, and let's just keep these keep these things uh, <laughs> separate. But they're they're really not. They're really not separate. Yeah, it's definitely a cultural thing. Like I remember when I lived in Venezuela before Emma and I got married. I remember people saying to me, "You have to understand if you marry a Venezuelan, you're." her fail. And I'm not saying that's across the board, but I will say that coming from the United States to Venezuela, I was like, wow, like these people definitely like have more relationships with their extended family than I have. They're much closer to them in proximity. <laughs> They're mm -hmm. much closer to them relationship wise, right, emotionally, yeah, emotionally. So yeah like the families are bigger. Like that's another cultural thing. Like I've got, you know, when I used to, when I lived in Venezuela and people are like, Oh, how many cousins do you have? And I said two, and they're like, what do you mean? You have two cousins. <laughs> like, like, are you sure you know, are you sure you understand my question? <laughs> and I'm like, I've got one aunt and one uncle and two cousins. And they're like, Whoa. Anyway. So <laughs> that's obviously like a big cultural thing of like, what does it look like for a family to support each other? What does it look like? And it's tough. Like, I mean, people have definitely brought that up, you know, behind closed doors when I meet with them about uh, we're worried about a sibling. We're worried about um, a parent, worried about a child. You know, that's a whole nother thing. Do we support our children? Do we help them out with their first home? Uh, there's really a lot to think about. And, mm -hmm. you know, I guess to, to wrap up, to wrap up things, it's, it's, it's the end of the day. It can be, a very heated conversation if it's happening at a time of stress. And so as much as possible, seek a way to converse about it. Not when a big thing has just happened, but like when you've had a chance to just kind of like simmer down over, over things. Right. To gain some, uh, to gain some perspective, uh, wait till you have a, uh have a moment of, uh, of, of peace or whatever to get, to have clarity and talk about it. I mean, that's a great, yeah, great sure. advice. I mean, mm -hmm. um, perfect. So, what else? What else should we cover? I think we've covered a lot of ground. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Enough for for one or more articles. <laughs> I'd say so. They only give me about like four or five sentences, so I think we're set. I'll send her like, like twenty pages of transcription and be like, "Boom, pick it." <laughs> And she's like, um, I'm going to take that first question and run with it. <laughs> yeah. So, so cool, man. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for setting it up. I think we should, I think we should end with one more uh, joke. Oh, okay. All right. Your joke or mine? Oh, do you have one? Do you have one for me? No. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, what's the best thing about Switzerland? Uh, chocolate. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the best thing about Switzerland is, but the flag is a big plus. <laughs> <laughs> a big <Ooh>. plus. <laughs> oh, dad jokes. Gotta love them. All right, man. Thanks so much for helping set this up. <laughs>
All right, I got oh, one more. Yeah. I got one more. Okay, okay, okay good, 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 good. For the law physicians. What kind of doctor is Dr. Pepper? He's Spice. a physician. Uh, <laughs> whoo. All right, then. <laughs> oh, that, that one made me sweat. Whew. That one was so good, I started sweating. All right, man. Take it easy. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay. Thank you. This is your host, Galen Nuttall. Thank you for joining me at A Clean Bill of Wealth, the podcast for Canadian doctors. I hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to check out my free video series at galenhelpsdocs.com, where I debunk some of the myths around wealth generation for Canadian doctors. Take care and talk to you soon.